So I just thank you very much. I really appreciate um, the introduction, my highs and my lows. Um, they, they all belong there. Uh, and Christine, thank you for having me back at uh, uh, this incredible house and uh, this incredible academy. And, and, and thank you all for, for coming out. I'm, uh, it's just a treat for me to be here. Uh, I've got some old friends here as well, and um, I've been looking forward to this evening. Um, there was a little, uh, I don't remember how they advertised this lecture, but however they advertised it, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what I am going to talk about tonight is, is the book I'm working on right now. I am, I hope some of you noticed, um, on halftime, now I'm just writing once a week because I, uh, I am working on a new book. Um, uh, and uh, as, as hinted, the book is called Thank You for Being Late pausing to reflect on the 21st century. Uh, and the title comes from, uh, quite authentically, uh, over the last couple of years, I would be meeting people for breakfast and, um, and they would, somebody would often come late, uh, 15, 20 minutes. They say, I'm really sorry, Tom, it was the traffic, it was the weather, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And um, uh, I would say to all of them, no, 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 no. Thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on that conversation over there. I've been people watching the lobby. It's been amazing who's been coming in. And I just connected three ideas that I've been working on for so long. So I now tell people all the time, thank you for being late. Um, and the book I'm working on, um, I guess a lot of ways to describe it, but you know, the world to me is a big data problem in many ways. Um, and I, could get, I guess you could call this book uh, my algorithm how I look at the world today, and how I order and make sense of what I see out there. Oh, is the ambassador coming? We'll, we'll wait for him then. We'll, uh, <laughs> 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 um, Thank you for being late. <laughs> so, um, we actually were sitting up there for half. <laughs> so, this book is very much still a work in progress, and I'm just really going to lay it out to you just in a very rough form because it's still in rough form, uh, chapter by chapter. Um, uh, the book begins, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. And um, uh, we don't need these. Um, once or twice a week, uh, I will take the subway to work, which involves driving to the Bethesda Hyatt. Uh, and underneath the Hyatt's a public parking garage in Bethesda. And there I catch the metro from the Bethesda station to, uh, to Washington, D.C. And uh, in early October, I did that, parked my car, took the subway in, came back, was driving out of the parking lot, and handed my parking uh, stub to the cashier. And um, he looked at it, he looked at me and said, I know who you are. I said, great, um, uh, I read your column, great. I don't always agree, even better. Um, <laughs> means you have to check. Um, and I drove off. And uh, a week later, I came back, parked my car, went into Washington, came back, same guy said, give him my parking stub, and this time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? <laughs> and I think, holy mackerel. The parking guy is my competitor now. Okay. <laughs> so um, I said, well, write down the address, and I will take a look at it. And I drove off, and it, well, he wrote it down on a little yellow 3M stick of uh, odinambi.com. I went home, I looked it up. He's clearly Ethiopian from the Amoral people and was writing about Ethiopian politics. I thought about him <laughs> and what had happened in the world that, you know, my parking guy is, is now writing his own blog. And I um, thought about it for about a week, and I decided I really need to interview this guy. So I started parking and taking the subway every day because I didn't have his email <laughs> and to see if I would run into him again. And it took a week and um, he was working the morning shift, 7 a.m. I came and I stopped under the uplifted gate. I knew his name at this point. I said, I, I need your email. I want to talk to you. 
So he wrote down his email. And I, I sent him a message that night. Uh, I reproduced all of these in the beginning of the book. We had a very funny set of exchanges. And I said, I have a proposition for you. Um, I will teach you how to write a column. And you will tell me your life story. And he said, I see you're proposing a deal. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like this deal. Okay. And um, so I was traveling. and. Um, <coughs> Three weeks later, we got together at Pete's Coffee Shop uh, near his office, as he said. I came from my <laughs> office near the White House, and, uh, and we met as just a couple of columnists at Pete's Coffee Shop. And his stories are great American stories, an immigrant um, from Ethiopia, uh, economics degree, uh, cares deeply about the politics and solidarity of his nation, and um, was uh, writing for Ethiopian websites, but they weren't, they weren't quite fast enough. Um, they would publish his stuff and people would react and he wanted to, them to go a little faster and so he started his own blog. And now, he said, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered. It's a, it's a great story. So then I fulfilled my side of the bargain. And um, I prepared for him uh, a basically a short memo on how to write a column. Uh, something I'd been thinking about over the years. I once taught a course on it when my daughter was in college, but it's a much uh, shorter form. And this really forced me to sit down and think about what I do. And I explained to him that um, uh, a new story is meant to inform, uh, and it can do it better or worse. But a column is meant to provoke. Um, you would never read a new story of mine and say, that, Tom, that, that, that new story didn't work. But you would, as my wife does once every six weeks, read a column of mine and say, Tom, that column didn't work. Okay. So what is it that makes a column work? What is it that makes a, a column work? Well, I am either in the heating business or the lighting business, or ideally both. That is, the purpose of a column is to produce either heat, to stoke something inside of you, a reaction, or to produce light, to illuminate something for you. Um, or ideally, in the best of cases, to do both. You've got to produce that kind of chemical reaction. And if you do it right, you will know you've got a column that works because it will produce one of ten reactions from your readers. Uh, the first is they'll read your column and say, I didn't know that. I didn't know that in service of an opinion. Not I didn't know equals mc squared, but I didn't know that about what's going on in Germany today. That's interesting. That's a column. Second is I never I never looked at it that way. People read your column and say that that's that's a good good column. Third is I I, I never connected those things. That that's a good column. That's a column that that's working. Four you live for this. It happens five six times a year if you're really doing your job. You said exactly what I felt, but I didn't know how to say, God bless you, God bless you. <laughs> you told me what I was thinking. Five is I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring, okay? Um, uh, because your column is defined as much by people who are against it as who are for it. Um, six, very hard to do. Don't, don't try this trick at home, kids. Um, you made me laugh, you made me cry. Very hard. When done well, it's fantastic. When done badly, it's cringe-inducing. Um, <laughs> six is, I, I bet that column didn't take long to write. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. Said as a compliment. Because I will tell you, my best columns take me as long as it takes my fingers to hit the keys. Take about 30 minutes to write. Because the muse is in residence, and the reader can tell. Seven is uh, you challenge me. It's when a liberal challenges liberals. Conservative challenges conservatives. You're challenging yourself. <laughs> Eight is as you said before. As you said before. Because to, this, to be a good columnist, I think you have to repeat yourself. Maybe you didn't see Wednesday's column. Maybe you didn't see Sunday's column. Maybe you didn't get that point. Maybe the context when I made that point mm -hmm. was different. And so I very often find different ways for a point that I think is vital, I find ways to repeat it. And lastly, you motivated me. You inspired me. I read your column and I did X, Y, and Z. So I explained these are the 10, well, they could be 20, whatever, but for me, these are the 10 main reactions to know you've got a column that worked. 
But then I explain, how do you actually produce heat or light? Because you've got to produce a spark. And that takes a chemical reaction. And therefore, the formula, I believe, for writing a good column is to combine three compounds. First is your own value set. What do you stand for? How do you lead into the world? What do you believe? Where are you coming from? Second is, how do you think the world works? I call that the machine. It's an idea I got from my friend Ray Dalio. That is, what do you think are the biggest forces shaping more things in more days, in more places, in more ways? How do you think the gears and the pulleys of the world work? Because as a columnist, what you're really trying to do is take your value set and move the machine in one direction or another. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? How people and culture affect you and the machine, and how you and the machine affect people and culture. Because there's no column without people and culture. Mix them all together in the right way, poof, you will create heat or light. And I explained all of this in, in a memo to my parking friend, and um, uh, we've had several discussions about it. But then I thought more about that, and it made me reflect further, well, what's my value set? What do I believe? How do I think the machine works today? What have I learned about people and culture in 35 years as a journalist about hey, how they affect the machine and how the machine is affecting them? And that's what the rest of the book is about. So the second chapter of the book is about where I come from. And it's called Always Looking for Minnesota. <laughs> uh, because I was born in a small town outside of Minneapolis in 1953. Uh, in a time and in a place when politics really worked. And you cannot possibly understand my politics and values if you don't understand where I came from. So whenever I think of the impact of growing up in uh, Minnesota when I did had on me, I always think of the opening scene in the play Jersey Boys. I don't know if some of you have seen that. You remember the opening monologue? The group's founder, Tommy DeVito, locates their beginning. DeVito comes on stage following a French rendition of the Four Seasons classic, Oh, What a Night. And he begins by saying, that's our song. Oh, what a night, c'est soir là. French, number one in Paris, 2000. How'd that happen? You ask four guys, you get four different versions. But this is where all of them start. Belleville, New Jersey, a thousand years ago. Eisenhower, Rocky Marciano, and a few guys under a street lamp singing somebody else's latest hit. Every time I listen to that riff, it transports me back to my roots. It was a long journey from St. Louis Park to the op-ed pages of the New York Times. How'd that happen? <laughs> yes, my family and friends, you get 40 different versions. But this is where all of them start. Minnesota, a thousand years ago. Hubert Humphrey, Walter Mondale, the Minnesota Vikings. Target, the Minnesota State Fair, and a few guys and girls growing up in a little one high school suburb called St. Louis Park. So I grew up in a really freaky 10 square mile uh, town uh, near Minneapolis. And I grew up with the Coen brothers, the filmmakers, Michael Sandel, the political theorist at Harvard, Norman Ornstein, the political scientist, Al Franken, uh, are now our senator, um, uh, um, uh, Sharon Isbin, the guitarist, Nate Burkus, the designer, and Mark Tressman, the coach of the Chicago Bears, who just got fired. <laughs> it was an amazing time. Uh, we were sort of the, our parents were second generation, moved from the north side of Minneapolis uh, out to this suburb. And uh, we were sort of first generation uh, post-ghetto American Jews growing up in a more open America. The Coen brothers based their 2009 movie, A Serious Man, on St. Louis Park, if any of you saw it. It was actually about our Hebrew school um, uh, that we all went through. And um, uh, when, we, when they were young, the Coen brothers often hung out at Mike Zoss Drug on Minnetonka Boulevard, a few miles from my house. And if you look closely in their classic film, No Country for Old Men, 
Uh, you'll notice that the pharmacy across the Mexican border that the lead character, Churga, played by Javier Bardem, enters to get medicine after he blows up a parked car is called Mike Sauce Pharmacy. <laughs> uh, one of many homages in their movies to our hometown and its unlikely Jewish community in these wintry Midwestern plains where we called ourselves the Frozen Chosen. Um, uh, <clears throat> in fact, the press kit for a serious man in Ethan Cohn, uh, he wrote, uh, to us, the flat Midwestern landscape with Jews on it was funny, you know? Maybe this is part of why we put the little story set in a shtetl at the beginning of the movie to kind of frame it. You look at the shtetl and you go, right, Jews in a shtetl. And then you look at the prairie in Minnesota and you kind of think of, what are we doing there? Um, <laughs> it, it, it seems odd, Joel Cohn said. Mel Brooks what, once had a song called Jews in Space. Um, I guess that's sort of the idea. Um, so after he retired, uh, Vice President Mondale asked me to give a talk at his law firm, and he asked the Cohn brothers and Al Franken and Norm Ornstein to all write introductions uh, for the talk, which he later published in the Minneapolis paper. And I won't read them all, but I'll read Al's, because again, it gives you a flavor of where we came from. Uh, it's my honor, he's writing to the Vice President Mondale, to write a letter that you can read aloud in your introduction of my friend Tom Friedman. I understand that it will save you from having to write something yourself and give you more time to take on your enormous workload at the Dorsey firm. Tom Friedman, Norm Ornstein, and the Cohn brothers and I are all part of what we like to call the St. Louis Park Jewish Mafia. By Jewish Mafia, we don't mean the Jewish gangsters who terrorized Minneapolis during the 30s and 40s. No, we mean the elite cadre of great thinkers and artists who went to the Hebrew school in St. Louis Park during the 60s. When people hear that the five of us all grew up in the same suburb, they're astonished. What was in the water, they ask. <laughs> um, but it's not a joke. During our childhood, St. Louis Park was home to a large creosote plant, which leached tons of toxic chemical into our groundwater. <laughs> studies, studies have shown this, Al Franken, that ingesting large quantities of creosote can lead to two things, increased intellectual creativity and or prostate problems. Uh, <laughs> This is why Tom insists that we all get regular prostate exams, <laughs> and why neither Norm nor Tom nor I drink large Diet Cokes before watching any of the Coen Brother movies. Of Tom's latest bestseller, let me say that when I wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, there's no greater comfort than having the Lexus and the olive tree there on my nightstand to put me back to sleep. <laughs> Have a great lunch, Senator Al Franken. Humor aside, uh, it was an amazing time to be growing up in Minnesota. These were the 30 glorious years. They were really our version of the 30 glorious years. Um, it was a time and a place when politics worked. Our political mentors were Hubert Humphrey, Don Fraser, Walter Mondale, Eugene McCarthy. Deeply progressive politicians, all of them, who cared not just about Minnesota, but cared about the world. And they were really our mentors. I grew up in a, the most liberal district in the state of Minnesota, and my entire life, my congressmen were liberal Republicans uh, because it was a time and a place where politics worked. The companies there, Dayton Hudson, Target, General Mills, basically invented corporate social responsibility. They thought it was the job of companies to build the Guthrie Theater or the Symphony Hall. Congressman Nolan from Minnesota, who later took over my district, he had a saying which I really loved. Growing up in Minnesota back then, you actually had to have a plan to fail. You, you actually, you needed a plan to fail. Because being in the, mid, in, in the middle class, and my parents were sconced in the middle class, my dad never made more than $20,000 a year. I went through public school with the same kids from kindergarten to graduation. It was a time of great stability. Um, uh, it, it could not help but um, shape the kind of optimistic um, uh, and basically uh, centrist person that I am uh, today. Well, I was home in Minnesota last summer for a wedding, and you know, there's something called Minnesota Nice. And um, my best example of it, my dear friend Jay Goldberg, I grew up with from fifth grade, his wife Eileen came to the wedding, and Jay told me that Eileen was driving on one of the big highways around Minneapolis that day, and a driver almost drove her off the road. And she said to him, Jay, I was so mad I almost honked. Okay? <laughs> that, that, is my, that is my definition of Minnesota nice, okay? <laughs> but it, it, uh, it bred in me 
uh, a deep centrism. I'm a radical centrist. By the way, I'm as radical about my centrism as you may be about your leftism or rightism. I don't believe every problem is solved in the center, but I think many more than we think are, that most problems have many complex sources and roots. Um, it bred in me a deep affection and belief in community, because I grew up in a real community, and it bred in me a huge affection for pluralism. Because back then, really, I was part of the minority. We, we really didn't have many Hispanics or African Americans at that time, uh, certainly in St. Louis Park. And those three things, uh, community, pluralism, uh, and centrism, really shape the value system that I come at the world. So that's how I lean into the world. How do I think the world works? So um, basically, if I were going to describe the machine today, I might have done it differently 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and certainly would have. What I would tell you that I think the, the biggest thing happening today, shaping more things in more places, in more ways, on more days, is that the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, are all in an exponential and simultaneous surge at the same time. So there's a book I read uh, a year and a half ago that had a big impact on me by uh, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee called The Second Machine Age. If you haven't read it, I urge you to do so. And they're two MIT professors, and Andy and Eric argue that the first machine age was built around the steam engine. And the steam engine doubled in power once every 70 years. And they argue that the second machine age that we're in right now is built on Moore's law, on the microchip, which Gordon Moore argued, and this is the 50th anniversary this week of Moore's law. Um, that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. And, um, and therefore, uh, that explains, they argue, what's going on today. Because they use this image, very famous image, of, uh, of the chessboard, the man um, who invented chess. And he gave the game to the king. King loved the game. He said, how can I reward you, dear sir? He said, I just want to feed my family. What would you like? He said, I'd just like you to take one kernel of rice and put it on the first square of the chessboard, your highness. Put two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, 16 on the next, and just keep doubling it. My family will be fine. <laughs> and uh, the king said, uh, it shall be done, not realizing that when you double something 63 times, the number you get is actually 18 quintillion. And Andy and Eric argue that if you want to understand where we are with Moore's Law today, is we just entered the second half of the chessboard, where the numbers start to get very big. And you start to see some really funky stuff. Self-driving cars, uh, computers you know, that can um, uh, diagnose disease or win in any chess tournament um, or any Jeopardy game. So as I thought about. Andy and Eric's thesis, uh, they're friends of mine. I said, you guys, you're, it's really smart of what you say about Moore's Law, but your image is incomplete. Because I think the market and Mother Nature are also in the second half of the chessboard. The market for me is globalization, the interconnectivity of markets, which I believe has gone from connected to hyperconnected to interdependent. And it's Mother Nature, and market for me is also debt. We've added 57 trillion in debt in, since 2008 as a globe. It's also going exponential. And lastly, it's Mother Nature. And Mother Nature to me is climate change, uh, which is now happening at 100 times faster rate uh, than after the last ice age in terms of carbon buildup in the atmosphere. It's population growth. I'm 61. I'm part of a very <coughs> unusual cohort, um, the only cohort since Adam met Eve that can say this. Uh, and that's that the world's population doubled in my lifetime. Uh, it was 3 billion in 59, and it was 6 billion in 99. And if I keep swimming regularly and eating yogurt, I may be here for another doubling, OK? Um, so the world's population is going like that. And lastly, it's biodiversity loss, which is happening at 1,000 times the background rate. So if you actually take all three of these, the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, and you graph them, what you'll see is that they all look like the same graph. They're all in an exponential surge. And one of the hardest things for human beings to grasp is exponentials. 
because we think linearly, and it's very hard to think of something going like that. Will it continue to be exponential? That's another question, but this is where we are. So let me just talk a little more detailed about um, what's going on. So let's talk about Moore's Law for a second. Um, uh, <coughs> whenever I, um, one of the ways I learn as a journalist is I, uh, I just like to listen to everyday speech. Because embedded often in everyday speech, hiding in plain sight, are all kinds of tells that something big is happening. So here's a few conversations uh, I've had in the last year that tell you something, something's up, something big is happening, uh, as uh, Anna said in her introduction. I was at a lecture um, in January to a group of bankers, and the person speaking, it was actually Andy McAfee, said, um, just in passing, he was referring to Aunt, um, a Gary Kasparov, the great Russian chess champ grandmaster, uh, and he referred to him as the last human chess champion. And I thought, wow, that's going to be a whole new category now, last human bus driver, last human pilot. We now have the last human cow milker in upstate New York. Uh, we had a story in the paper yesterday about robotic bartenders. The last human X, I think, is going to be uh, a new category. Um, I was out in Stanford having uh, breakfast with Sebastian Thrun, the um, founder of Audacity and uh, uh, head of Google X. And uh, uh, Sebastian mentioned to me in passing that he was taking flying lessons. And we started talking about flying and flight and training. And we got onto the subject of the Asiana air crash at San Francisco airport on July 6, 2013. And um, uh, Sebastian said to me, oh, Tom, that plane crashed because of good weather. I said, no, no, you, you mean the plane crashed because of bad weather. No, no, he said, had there been bad weather, they'd have been on autopilot. Um, uh, the plane was entirely human error. The plane crashed because of good weather. You don't, you don't hear that often. Third, I uh, was playing in a golf tournament out in California uh, a couple months ago. And um, uh, we were waiting around between holes. And I was talking to my caddy, who's from Carmel, California. That's where we were. And um, he, started, he was referring to a hotel out in Carmel. And um, again, just in passing, he said, <laughs> that hotel. John F. Kennedy had a lot of fun at that hotel before the internet. Um, <laughs> and uh, I thought, wow, a whole new historical divide. AD and BC, AI and BI, before the internet and after the internet. Before there was privacy and after there was privacy. So these are just a few of the things that tell you that something really big is happening. And what's happening is that if you think of the four parts of a computer, going back to the first mainframe down to, down to this thing, a uh, computer basically consists of four components. One is the microchip, the thing that's doubling by Moore's Law. Um, and if you want to know the power of Moore's Law, um, I was out at Intel interviewing them for the book. Uh, Gordon Moore is one of the founders, co-founders of Intel. And um, Brian Krasanich, the uh, CEO of Intel, um, told me this. He said, if the auto industry, if the American auto industry, in the last 50 years, doubled in capacity the way the, in, the uh, semiconductor industry doubled the power of microchips over the last 50 years, um, a automobile today would get nearly 300 miles, go, go nearly 300 miles per hour. It would get 2 million miles per gallon, <laughs> and it would cost 4 cents. Um, <laughs> that's the power. That's the kind of computing power uh, we're now making for more money uh, with, with less power use. Second part of the computer, of course, is the networking, the thing that communicates within the computer and then outside, and of course, that's now moved to, again to this thing, mo mobility. Um, and I was out of Qualcomm, and they do Moore's Law for mobility chips, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and they pointed out to me that um, the uh, uh, 4G technology today um, uh, over 2G technology is a 12,000 time improvement. It's basically a little more than, than a decade. I just like to you know, read the local papers wherever I go, and I was in India in October 2010, and the Hindustan Times that day ran a news item reporting that a Nepali telecommunications firm had just started providing third generation mobile network service, or 3G, at the summit of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. 
this, the story said, would allow thousands of climbers and trekkers who throw on the region every year access to high-speed internet and video <laughs> using their mobile phones. Do you know how many phone calls are being made as we sit here tonight from the top of Mount Everest <laughs> that begin, Mom, you'll never guess where I'm calling you from. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's networking in the second half of the chessboard. Um, uh, of course, the fourth part of the, then there's storage, that's the third part of the computer, I won't talk about that, uh, and then there's the software. And all these are going through their own Moore's Law. L I would, last Saturday, I spoke at the Walmart Saturday morning meeting, and it's a, that's an adventure, and uh, <laughs> in Bentonville, New Jersey, and um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it was really a, a lot of fun, and um, uh, I was down there because at Walmart invited me to address their Saturday morning. It was a giant town hall thing. I was the warm up act for Kevin Costner. It was amazing. Um, this is all in Bentonville. You can't imagine what goes on down there. And um, uh, I told them I would come and do it, but I wanted to be paid. And uh, the New York Times doesn't allow me to take money. So um, this is how I want to be paid. I want you to uh, get your top tech people together and explain to me everything that happens when you press buy on walmart.com if I want to buy a 32-inch television on my cell phone. And we spent two hours doing that. And that is truly amazing, the different signals that go out. But what was struck me most was that, uh, this is a software point, um, the guy who heads up um, technology, the CTO for, for Walmart today, used to be the CTO for eBay. And he pointed out that uh, when he was at eBay, they built their uh, e-commerce platform uh, took with 200 people, and Walmart in the last two years built an identical platform with 12. Uh, and that's because software is also going through its own Moore's Law, thanks to open source software. And you can now get off the shelf all of these things. And the whole place where innovation is going is away from the engineering, which is becoming a commodity, and toward the imagination of how to put these now software blocks together. And of course, what it's all doing is coming together in the cloud, which is exponentializing all four of these even more. So, um, uh, and we, we uh, the market I said uh, is, is about interconnectivity. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, and of course, uh, the mother mm -hmm. nature point. What is the impact, therefore, of all three of these things? How is the machine working to re, not only make our world faster, that's nothing. It's actually reshaping that's really what's going on. How is that being played out under the impact of the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law all going exponential? Well, I point to several things that are going on. First of all, this is a great time to be a maker. This is an amazing time to be able to and want to start up a company. Um, uh, and as much in India as in Mexico, uh, as in Berlin and in America. And that's because, thanks to what's going on today, complexity is now free. Complexity is free. I actually got that line. I was visiting GE Labs last year, and they were showing me the 3D printing that they do with 3D printers. And they explained to me that they could now make a new part, an engine fastener for a jet engine, GE jet engine, that um, used to take six months. They now do in two weeks. Um, because all of the software now can do this for you. And they said to me when I was there, and it really stuck in my mind, Tom, <laughs> complexity is now free. And what that means, I think, for the world is fantastic. Because we now have so many people around the world who are going to contribute to solving the world's biggest problems. I wrote The World is Flat in, in 2004 um, about a time that um, uh, what, it, what the book was really about was about a moment that happened right at the turn of the century when there was just enough connectivity in the world for us to leverage 200,000 Indian engineers to solve our problem. Mm -hmm. And what was our problem at the time? You recall Y2K, okay? That we needed all these computers remediated because we were sure that when the calendar turned over in the year 2000, they were all gonna stop. And only place you could get 200,000 engineers to do that at a reasonable price was in India and right around the year 2000, by coincidence, we had just enough connectivity to leverage them to solve our problem. 
What you see if you go to India today and you meet NASCOM or if you go to Mexico today, you'll see them using all these tools now to solve their problems. Problems of, uh, of clean water, uh, of remote electricity, of uh, a dollar a month health care. You have amazing innovation going on in these countries because the complexity is now free and they're bringing it back to our end of the world at their cost platform. It's an incredibly great time to be a maker. Unfortunately, when it's a great time to be a maker, it's a great time to be a breaker. And um, uh, it's not only the good guys that are getting super empowered, uh, it's also the bad guys. ISIS operates uh, on a command and control platform called Twitter, Facebook, and Google. Um, uh, we provide the, the basically platform for their command and control system, not, not to mention uh, the email. There was, you'll recall, a drone that landed in the White House backyard um, uh, a couple months ago uh, by a hobbyist um, who launched it and lost control of it, and it landed uh, on the south lawn of the White House. Um, uh, he bought that drone at Radio Shack. Um, uh, all of these tools that make the world great for makers uh, make them great for breakers. And I believe the balance of power in the world, if 20 years ago you wanted to understand the balance of power here at the Berlin Academy, you would have brought Henry Kissinger. And he could have brilliantly explained to you the balance of power between nation states. To understand the balance of power today, you need to understand the balance of power between nation states and between makers and breakers. It's, there are so many more people in this equation today. I think the third impact is that um, very hard time to lead anything, okay? You do not want to be a leader in the second half of the chessboard. In fact, you don't want to run anything in the second half of the chessboard <laughs> because every leader today, whether um, uh, it's Inez at her newspaper, uh, Barack Obama, or Xi Jinping, every leader today is in a two-way conversation with, their, with the lead. The day of one-way, top-down conversations are over. And every citizen today is walking around with what my friend Dove Seidman calls a portable MRI machine in one hand. Not an x-ray, that's so 1990s. A portable <laughs> MRI machine in one hand to look inside you, and a megaphone, it doubles as a megaphone in the other, to tell the world what they see without a filter, a libel lawyer, or an editor, okay? <laughs> All right? So you, you, you don't want to lead anything in the second half of the chessboard. Um, I think this is going to be uh, a really critical time, and you will have a great advantage in the world we're going into shaped by these forces uh, if you have a pluralistic society. Pluralism, the importance of pluralism, is going to just, I think, uh, explode in importance. And the place I can point that or demonstrate that to you most vividly is uh, Iraq and Syria today. So if you want to understand what's going on in the Middle East today, in, in, in my view, uh, it's very simple. You're talking about Iraq and Syria, Yemen, uh, you're talking about a pluralistic region that lacks pluralism, okay? It's a pluralistic region. We all know Sunnis, Shiites, Kurds, Druze, Turkmen, Christians, uh, all kinds of people, but it has no pluralism to bound it together. Therefore, its pluralistic character was always governed vertically from the top down by iron fists. First, for 500 years, they were called Ottomans. Uh, then they were called British and French. Then they were called kings and dictators. What's basically happening today is no more Ottomans, no more British and French, and fewer and fewer kings and dictators. So the pluralistic character of this region can no longer be managed vertically it can only be managed horizontally by the constituent communities forging social contracts for how to live together as equal citizens. What you're seeing is a giant region go from vertical to horizontal. Now you can do that if you have one of three tools. One is if you have a Mandela to, to guide that transition. Turns out there was only one of those and he didn't work the Middle East. Second is if you have a far-sighted military. We hope that would be the case in Egypt uh, after 2011. Turned out not to be true. Third is if you have a midwife. That was the role we aspired to play and did incredibly badly in Iraq. 
If you have no Mandela, no military, and no midwife to take you from vertical control to horizontal control, you have Iraq and Syria for you. That's what, what you basically have. And therefore, the ROI, the return, the value on pluralism in a world where hierarchical control is disappearing everywhere, if you can forge communal bonds and social contracts, you are going to have such an advantage in this world going forward. It's why I'm still a, a bull on America. We have huge problems. We've had Ferguson. We've had these terrible police shootings. We are a work in progress. But we have twice now elected a black man whose middle name is Hussein, whose grandfather was a Muslim, who defeated a woman to run against a Mormon. <laughs> who does that? OK, so um, we are a work in progress. But um, no, it's, uh, unfortunately, we still got a lot of work to do. But, um, the value of pluralism in this world, in the second half of the chessboard, it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be huge. Um, then we get to, I think, two of the core things that are challenging Germany, America, and every country <coughs> in the world. One is that average is over. Average is over for every worker, and average is over for every country. Let's talk about countries first. Uh, in the Cold War, you could be an average country. Because there are two superpowers competing over you, throwing money at you, building your government house, your stadium, educating your kids in East Germany, or at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow, or the University of Texas. And if you're Egypt and Israel, you could lose two wars. You're Egypt and Syria, excuse me. You could lose two wars to Israel, and someone would come and rebuild your whole army. <laughs> oh, it's good to be average. And on top of that, it was a world of walls, so you never had to worry about competition from China. Now today, no more Cold War and no more walls. I was in Egypt for Tahrir Square for the revolution there. It was an amazing experience. When I was done, two and a half weeks later, when the thing began to go into the next phase, I left. I came home. I said, Cairo Airport, went into the souvenir shop to buy the missus a little souvenir. I've been gone for two and a half weeks. What would she like? What would she like? How about a pyramid's ashtray? OK? Um, the missus doesn't smoke, but it would remind her of my time in Egypt. Turn it over, and what does it say on the bottom? Say it with me now. Made, Made in China. China. That's right. You're the lowest wage country in the Eastern Mediterranean, and there's now a country half a world away can make your national icon into an ashtray, OK? <laughs> and sell it cheaper than you can, OK? Oh, average is over. And now we get to the problem in the news here. Because here's what I think is actually going on. Strong countries are being stressed by this, and weak countries are blowing up. And the countries that are blowing up first are almost, they almost all have one thing in common, <coughs> straight line borders. Watch out for every country whose border is a straight line, OK? <laughs> all right? Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Eritrea, these all have straight lines. Texas. And um, <laughs> we're, we're, not a, we're not a country. <laughs> not a country. Uh, also, lots of jagged lines, and we're not a country. We're, we're a lender, I think. <laughs> we're a state, any kind of side of country. Um, the countries with the straight lines are all the most artificial. And under the pressure of the market mother nature and Moore's law, they're the first to blow up. So I, I, I was part of a documentary series last year on Showtime called Years of Living Dangerously. It was about climate change. I hope some of you got a chance to see it. I did three uh, parts in the series. I did in, uh, climate change in Egypt, climate change in Yemen, and climate change in Syria. Um, and that took me to Raqqa province in northern Syria uh, a year and a half ago uh, before ISIS was there. Uh, where we interviewed the climate refugees. You can't understand at all what happened in Syria if you don't understand that between 2006 and 2010, Syria had the worst drought in its modern history, okay? A million Syrian farmers and herders left their land, all right, flocked to the cities, completely overwhelmed the infrastructure. Assad did nothing for them. That was Mother Nature's contribution. And then Moore's Law came along with these and got them all connected. 
the Arab Spring started, they did start the Arab Spring. But once it started, they, with the first call of Allahu Akbar, as one of them said to us, we could not wait to join. This was a revolution of this hungry, of climate refugees, as much as it was about politics. You can't, <coughs> Syrian revolution began in the two driest spots in the country, Dara and Kamishli. So you see how these forces now can put pressure on these countries and are literally blowing them up. And as a result, I think the new geopolitics in the world, the new divide in the world, is no longer east, west, north, south, communist, capitalist. The new divide in the world is between the world of order and the world of disorder. And what's going on today is that people are flocking out of the world of disorder just to get to the world of order. You think southern Italy has a problem? Uh, I take you to Israel. You know, the last big fence the Israelis built was from a lot all the way to Gaza. Why is that? Because uh, a year earlier, this now three years ago, 52,000 Eritrean, South Sudanese, and Ethiopians walked, sailed, bussed, and trained across the Sinai to Israel. Not because they discovered Zionism, okay? But because they were just leaving the world of disorder to find one little island of order. You know, Israel has a comedy show, their kind of version of Saturday Night Live. It's called Eretz Nederet. Um, wonderful country. It's a very funny, ironic show. And two years ago, the opening scene, again, these are little tells. Uh, the show opened, the season opened with a beautiful Garden of Eden scene, flowers budding, birds tweeting, butterflies flying across, and then whoop, suddenly a wall comes up around me. I was there a year ago for the next season to start. Same thing. Beautiful Garden of Eden scene, butterflies, birds chirping. Then a wall comes up, whoop, and then a dome comes over the top. <laughs> whoop. That's their self-awareness. And that's not just about the airport. It's that... They've got thousands now of refugees just looking to get out of the world of disorder, walking to Israel. Now, 52,000 is, is an interesting number because um, it's uh, uh, maybe just an well, it's obviously an accident, but last year, 52,000 uh, Guatemalans, Hondurans, and El Salvadoran children, orphans, were sent by their parents from uh, from uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras to the United States. And by the way, what do those three countries have in common? Straight lines, okay? And they all are the most deforested countries in Central America, Mother Nature, okay? Um, they deforested their hillsides, we got their kids. So the bad news, I think, for Europe is you're just at the beginning of this. This is not some, uh, we just solve a few Refugees, I, I believe you are now bordering the biggest region of disorder uh, on the planet. And this is going to be a huge problem uh, for, for, for you, for, for us, and for, for the Lord knows, for the people fleeing uh, these areas. Um, last impact is uh, that average is over for every worker. Because every boss today has cheaper, easier, more efficient access to above average automation, above average software, above average cheap labor above average cheap genius. There was something when I was back in Minnesota. You see, being, growing up in Minnesota back then, and it's an allegory for me of a whole time, um, my parents were solidly middle classes. And um, for them, being in the middle class was like an elevator ride. They got in the elevator in 1953. My mom was in the Navy. Uh, my dad worked for a ball bearing company. They pressed the button that said MC, middle class. Took them up, they got off on the middle class floor, and they stayed there their whole lives. Today, being in the middle class is like walking up a down escalator. We've all done it as kids. You can walk up a down escalator as long as you always walk faster than the escalator and as long as you always keep walking. And that's really, we can talk more about uh, these tensions later, but that, I think, is going to be uh, the biggest impact. Let me try to wrap this up with just a couple more points and we can open it to discussion. So the next part of the book is called Everything I Learned About Foreign Policy I Learned from Mother Nature. Um, and that's because um, I believe that what we have created in the second half of the chessboard today is a network of networks, a network of markets, a network of data and telecommunications that today is so interconnected, hyperconnected, and intertwined, the world we've created, that it mirrors only one other thing in its complexity, and that is the natural world. 
So if you want to understand how we keep our world stable, a good place to start is actually to study nature and how the natural world maintains its stability. And that's what this chapter is about. Of course, if you study nature, what you see is that nature maintains its stability through three basic mechanisms. One is natural selection, adaptation. The most adaptive species, as Darwin taught us, not the strongest, is the one that survives. Second, nature maintains healthy interdependencies by building its complexity around small-scale networks. Very hard to break nature, because it's actually built up of multiple small-scale networks. It isn't some top-down pyramid. And lastly, nature is incredibly diverse. Uh, it's incredibly polymorphic. We throw up 20 species, the one that survives, that will move on. But nature does this unconsciously. And it's evolved its inter healthy interdependencies over, we know, millennia. And I, I'm a big believer in, in, um, uh, in studying nature as a, 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 as, as a the founder of biomimicry, you know, describes as, as both a mentor um, and as a model. And I think it's the best way to understand actually what's going on in the political world today. I'll just give you one example from that chapter um, about hell, how to build healthy interdependency. So in doing this documentary last year on climate change, I said we went to Egypt, Yemen, and Syria. And the Egypt part was about, for those of you who follow the revolution there, you know the chant in Tahrir Square was actually bread, freedom, dignity. Okay, Bread, freedom, why, why, why bread? Because in 2010, the world food prices hit their all-time recorded high according to the World Food uh, Organization, because in 2010, you'll remember, uh, there were drought and wildfires and floods in Russia, China, and Australia, and drought in the Midwest in America. And that drove global food prices. I think uh, nine of the 10 world's biggest food importers are in the Arab world, in the Middle East, drove them to all-time high. So we decided to start our film about Tahrir Square, because uh, bread prices went up seven times right before the revolution. Uh, we decided to start it in Salina, Kansas, at the experimental farm of a man named Wes Jackson. And Wes is trying to develop a perennial <laughs> form of wheat and, um, that would grow without tilling in the prairie. And Wes gave me a tutorial about the prairie. And he explained to me, Tom, the prairie was incredibly diverse. It was a polyculture. And it naturally fertilized and pesticided itself. It was incredibly resilient. What we Americans did when we settled the land is we wiped out, in many places, the polycultural prairie, and we planted monocultures, monoculture crops, wheat, corn, and sorghum. Monocultures are enormously susceptible to disease, and therefore they require high amounts of high-density fossil fuels in order to be stabilized. Um, when the Dust Bowl happened, the, uh, all the monoculture crops died, but the prairie where it was left, survived, because it had that resilience. So he was explaining this to me, and I said, you know, that's really interesting, Wes. When you think about it, Al-Qaeda is using high-density fossil fuels in the form of donations from Arab oil states to try to wipe out the polyculture of the Arab Muslim world. The Arab Muslim world was an incredible polyculture in Spain and North Africa at its height, and replace it with a monoculture that's enormously susceptible to diseased ideas. And while I was on a roll, I suggested to him that the Tea Party in America was using high-density fossil fuels from the Koch brothers to try to, wipe out, to try to wipe out the polyculture of the Republican Party. The Republican Party at its height was an amazing polyculture. Teddy Roosevelt gave us national parks. Um, uh, Richard Nixon gave us the Clean Air, Walk, uh, Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the EPA. Okay, um, Richard Nixon gave us, ra Richard, um, uh, Ronald Reagan gave us radical arms control, and George Bush, the father, invented cap and trade. This party was an incredible polyculture, but we now have people using high density fossil fuels from the Koch brothers to wipe out the polyculture of the Republican Party and turn it into a monoculture that's enormously susceptible to diseased ideas. Okay? Um, and you can use these images. I have a whole chapter, ISIS as an invasive species. It's amazing <laughs> what you can learn from nature about how this system we are in works. And I'm not going to dwell on that any further. Let me just end by making two points. Um, one is about people and culture. And I'm not going to go into this in detail. But we can talk about it in the question. Because the simple point I make is when something really big happens in nature, um, it has to adapt, uh, use its small scale networks, 
and uh, give polymorphic uh, pluralistic responses. And I would argue that the societies and communities and nation states that are going to do best in the wake of this really big thing happening with the machine all going into uh, acceleration are those that are the most adaptive, built around the most small scale networks and communities, and the most polymorphic and diverse. Um, and I think if you, again, if you, if you look at what's going on in nature, that's the argument. So let me simply end by, um, uh, by making this point. Um, let me just find this here. Um, where's the top of that? So I'm, I'm going to read this because it's, uh, it's just better read. Uh, on March 3rd, so the, the, the last chapter is called Thank You for Being Late. Um, and you'll see why. Uh, on March 3rd, 2015, CNN Money carried the following news story. Uh, it said, Jennifer Anston lauds the benefits of Avino. Bud Light shows off beer at a concert. And Secret, the deodorant, sells its freshly scented mist. Um, pretty standard commercials, you'd say, right? But what's different is what comes after the content, or the content that comes after the commercials. In this case, they're all followed by ISIS and jihadi videos. Video sites like YouTube sell ad time to companies, and the ads get automatically inserted before the videos play. Advertisers don't directly control where their ads are placed, although they can specify the demographics they'd like to target. From a contract perspective, these corporations that are paying lots of money to get YouTube clicks may not be pleased when they find out that their videos are being placed right before an ISIS recruitment video. You can go online to see these. Um, though some videos may not violate YouTube policy against inciting violence, they might not be appropriate for advertising. Uh, it's almost impossible to know how many companies' ads have run before videos like this. But at least two companies were unhappy with the content pairing. We were unaware that one of our ads ran in conjunction with this video, the vice president of consumer connections at Anheuser-Busch, the beer company, told CNN Money. We have strict guidelines with our media partners that govern when and how our ads appear. We are working with YouTube and our media buying agency, Mediacom, to understand and rectify this matter. Um, an Indian, Indian industry analyst at YouTube would uh, said that uh, YouTube would make about $10 per thousand clicks on these ads. A person familiar with YouTube's business model says the company didn't make money from these specific ads. If they had, profits would have been sent back to the advertiser. Since CNN Money reached out, ISIS-related videos had been taken down. The other videos remain online, but the ads have been removed. What is this story about soap and beer commercials on ISIS YouTube videos telling us? It's something, I think, quite profound and central to the core challenge of every society today and the global community at large. If we want to maintain a world that is stable and offering more opportunities to lead a dignified and thriving life for more people, we have to pause. We have to pause and think and reflect. We cannot let the system be on autopilot if we want stability. Unlike nature, which produces stability unconsciously, we have to be consciously making political and value choices. Because when you remove as much friction between people, machines, markets, and governments as we have, when you redistribute as much power from institutions to individuals and robots as we have, when you create a world with not only superpowers but super empowered individuals as much as we have, when you put as many strangers into proximity this fast and far as much as we have, when you make the world as interdependent as we have, when you automate as many things as we have, and you do it all without really stopping to think about the values that have to go with this profound set of changes, this really big thing that's happening, you are asking for trouble. You are asking for soap, beer, and deodorant commercials to run automatically in front of ISIS videos on YouTube. My friend Dove Seidman likes to say, my teacher and friend, we're not in a changing world, we're in a reshaping world. It is taking on a whole new shape. But the world has changed faster than we have changed ourselves. And we have to play catch up. We have become way, way too romantic about the power of technology. We are letting technology do the work that human beings should never give up doing. 
Someone made the decision to let YouTube algorithm determine what ads would go on a video. And that, and they never, this was never the job of technology before. That was the job of people and politics and values. Big data doesn't always mean big answers. Technology creates possibilities of understanding and connection, but we've got to make the hard decisions about which ones to choose based on sustainable values, says Dove. Values that sustain and endure, not situational values. Just do whatever the algorithm or situation suggests. When the world becomes just one big crowded theater, we need to be much more conscious, says Dove, of the effects of our words, behavior, and actions on others, including future generations. And unlike nature, being conscious, not just aware, not just alert like an animal, but being truly conscious is a distinctly human quality that something machines will never and nature will never be able to approximate. And consciousness comes from the root conscience, meaning to have an inner compass. The ability to be conscious, said Dove, of the other is rooted in having a conscience, in having values and principles. If I don't have a moral conscience, then I cannot be conscious of the other and my impact on them. Sociopaths and psychopaths are not aware of their impact on others. In a crowded theater, I need to feel and have moral reactions to how I affect you, he said. And that's why pausing today is so much more important. Because the pause, the pause is when things start. When you hit a pause button on a computer, said Dove, you stop. When you hit a pause button in life is when you start. That's when you start to really think. So that's why I think our challenge going forward <coughs> is we have to do three things at once. We have to get fast, fair, and slow all at the same time. <laughs> we got to get faster because the world is faster. I swear I didn't do this, OK? Um, but it is getting faster. That means learning faster. Um, uh, studying faster, um, uh, trying to constantly um, build our <laughs> improving society faster. I have an interview in the book with an <laughs> Olympic whitewater kayak Olympic bronze medalist. And she explains how you steer a kayak in white water. And there's only one way to steer a kayak in white water. You have to paddle faster than the water. And the worst thing you can do in a kayak in white water is stick your paddle in the water. Uh, you'll, you'll go into a spin and you'll completely flip and lose control. But we got to get fair because this system has the ability to leave people behind so much faster than ever before. And nature, there's one way we cannot mimic nature. Nature does live by survival of the fittest. And those that aren't fit are discarded. We cannot have that kind of society. That's just survival of the fittest. Fairness is going to become an increasingly more important issue. Lastly, though, we got to slow down. Uh, we got to slow down and press that pause button and think about the values that we want to build, the sustainable values, not the situational values. And this will sound hokey and simplistic and so Minnesota. But there has never been a time than the world we are going into when that golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, will be more important because we are entering a world where more people will have the power to do unto others farther, faster, deeper, and cheaper than ever before. So let me end where I began, back in Minnesota. Because that's why I keep going back there. You know, I have a favorite so fo so folk singer, Brandi Carlisle. She has a folk song that I just really love. It's called the I. And the re main refrain is, you can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the I. And Minnesota, for me, is kind of the I. That place where politics worked, where community was real, where my friends were my friends, not followers or Facebook <laughs> clicks. And yes, where when people do something reckless on the highway, you almost honk. 
And that's why the last line of the Jersey Boys resonates with me as much as the first line. Uh, this time it's Frankie Valli talking, looking back on his career as the lead singer with the Four Seasons. They ask you, says Frankie Valli, at the end of that movie, what was the high point? The Hall of Fame, selling all those records, pulling Sherry out of the hat. It was all great. But the first time the four of us made that sound, our sound, when everything dropped away, and all there was was the music. That was the best. That's why I'm still out there singing. Like that bunny on TV with the battery. I just keep going and going and going. Chasing the music. Trying to get home. Thank you very much. So we have time for some questions. And thank you very much. That's what I'm working on. I hope you'll all buy it when it comes out. Um, I just have to finish it now. But we have time for some questions. And uh, feel free to please identify yourself. Hi. Uh, Quincy Liu. Uh, you probably surprised I know the St. Louis, St. Louis Park very well. I've eaten in the St. Louis Park Delhi many, many times. Oh, <laughs> great. And uh, spend lots of time on Lake Cajon. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, also, when I when I'm skiing in Utah every year, if I want to cut the answer when people ask me where do you come from, I have a very complicated background, uh -huh. and if I don't want the story to go on and on, I said I'm from Minnesota, <laughs> because I can fake my way. Yeah. Uh, but then, as you said. I know about how important Minnesota, nice to the Minnesotans, uh, as a smaller microcosm of the USA as a whole. How did it produce uh, Michelle Bachman? Uh, <laughs> uh, not just Michelle Bachman, the governor, um, uh, our wrestler governor. Um, I'm afraid, and I'm not being cute, that was after the 30 glorious years. Um, <laughs> That was not the Minnesota of the, of the 50s and 60s. That was the Minnesota of the 90s. It was a different country. It was a different America. It's a different Minnesota now. Um, and uh, it, um, uh, you know, our politics mirrors uh, in many ways, but not entirely, you know, the rest of the country. Although I'm proud to say my home district, St. Louis Park today, you couldn't make this up, is represented by Keith Ellison, who is the only um, a black Muslim member of the US Congress. How do you like that? <laughs> so we've got Michelle Bachman, but we've also got Keith. <laughs> yeah, somebody else? I'm sorry, I can't see. Left you speechless. Great. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Andrew Guinness. Uh, you know, thinking about acceleration, and it's getting, our world is getting faster and faster. In what ways can we work towards slowing it down? Mm -hmm. You look at young people today, you look at the media, you're a journalist, you know, for example, using television news as an example, reports 30, 40 years ago were more in depth. They were mm -hmm. three to four, five, six minutes in length. Now they're much, much shorter. Sure. It seems everything is it's brevity, fast, yeah. faster, shorter. What can we do to reverse this trend? Yeah, well, it's a very good question. and. Um, you know, um, the first is simply to be to be conscious of it. You know that. Um, you know, again, to quote uh, my friend Dove, one of the real challenges we face today is, uh, you know, this. W what's going on in the technology sphere is is actually creating, in my view, a, a, almost like a supernova of energy. Um, that is the only equivalent in history is uh, Gutenberg's invention of the printing press, but that played out over two hundred years. And this is playing out over a much shorter time, over a much broader scale of people. Because Gutenberg was really confined for, for, for a long time. So um, uh, it's incredible, th this, this force, is, first of all, it's an incredible solvent. And what I mean is that it, um, it's giving us freedom from, this is Dove's phrase, so many things. So cab drivers now have freedom from working for the local cab company. They can work for Uber. 
university students have freedom from a bad professor. They can now go on a MOOC. Um, so we're getting all kinds of freedom from, and Egyptians thought they were getting freedom from Mubarak. Um, the problem is what we're not getting is freedom to. So we got all kinds of people now floating around who've gotten their freedom from, but freedom to requires institutions built on shared values. Mm -hmm. And one of the worrying things for me about this system, and I'm only sort of being half tongue in cheek that you don't want to lead anything, is that on the one hand it's great for bringing things down, but it, it seems to actually be really bad for building things up. Um, uh, because it, 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 everyone can be a leader. Everyone can think they can be a leader. And you really saw this play out in Egypt, um, where no one could get any elevation enough to actually you know, lead freedom to you know, for Egypt. Now there are other things that were a problem as well. And so I think you have to be conscious of it. I, I'm not on, I don't really, New York Times tweets my column, but I, I, don't, I don't really spend much time on Twitter. I, I, I don't, you know, not on Facebook, basically. I, I actually, I'm a, I, I talk the talk of globalization. I do not walk the walk. <laughs> okay. um, I am a deeply disconnected person most of the time, and I'm a late adopter of all technology, okay? Because if it works for me, it's fine, okay? Because we, um, I, and I find people um, who will, you know, you'll be in an argument with them and they'll say, uh, but, but, but Mr. Friedman, but I read it on the internet. As if that settles the bar bet, you know. Um, the internet is an open sewer of untreated, unfiltered information. Okay, and um, no, really, and our job as leader, as not my job, but the job of leaders and, and spiritual leaders and parents is actually to build into your kids the filters, because you're not going to be there with them, so they can interact now with this world globally, when and sort out, you know, what is fact and fiction. You know, the best I been writing books since 1989, wrote Beirut to Jerusalem, and so it's given me a chance to speak all over, all over the world like this, but all over America. You ask me, what's the best question? Be the best question in 36 years you got. The best question I ever got was in Portland, Oregon. Guy stood up in the balcony. I was uh, out on the road with Lexus and the olive tree, and he said, Mr. Friedman, you're talking about all this cyberspace. This is early on, you know, in the internet age. I have a question. Is God in cyberspace? <laughs> Oh, I said, that's a good question. <laughs> and I didn't have an answer. So I came home from that trip, and I called um, my rabbi. It's V. Marx, lives in Amsterdam, my spiritual, who I go to for spiritual questions. I'm not a religious person, but I go to Svi for questions. And I called him, I was told, I got this question. And I, did, I didn't have an answer. What should I have said? And he said, you know, Tom, um, in our tradition, the Jewish faith, um, uh, we have two conceptions of God that wrestle with each other. One is that God is an almighty being who smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, God sure as hell ain't in cyberspace because <laughs> it's full of pornography, gambling, lying, <laughs> hatred, hate speech, you name it. I mean, God is definitely not in cyberspace, okay, if that's your view of God. Uh, the other conception of God is that God reveals himself through us by how we behave. And if we want God in cyberspace, you got to bring him there by how you behave there, okay? And uh, so I think all these values questions, they've been totally lost in the technology pizzazz and jazz. You can't download this stuff, you know. Um, uh, in Alexis and Alfre, in the paperback, I actually put this story in and, and made the point that if I had my way, every modem, then we need a modem to get on the internet back then, Every modem in America sold, or one of these today, would come with a warning from the Surgeon General, like cigarettes. Um, uh, and it would simply say, warning, judgment not included. Okay? Um, because, you know, we got, we got so many people who are, that's the, the YouTube video. You can't make that up. You know, Avina ads on YouTube ISIS videos is what happens when we don't, when we outsource values and value make. I, I can talk technology, believe me, I can do the rap with anybody. But I have a lot of problem with Silicon Valley myself. I'm not a libertarian. I don't believe in any of that crap, frankly. Um, uh, I grew up in a real community uh, based on shared values and institutions. And there's a lot about that world. I'm interested, I want to understand it, because I can't do my job, which is explain the world, unless I go deep there. But I have not drunk the Kool-Aid at all. Um, and this book is about 
is, is, is partly about that. That's why Minnesota is very important for me. So, oh, we got, yeah, please. Um, Kimberly Marchello, yeah. I'm an international board human rights watch, Great. as well as my other job. Yeah. Um, so I like your uh, concept of what happened in the Middle East that the horizontal, I mean, I'm using the Middle Russia. East as example, mm -hmm. it's happened in other places, but the horizontal became, I mean, the vertical became right. horizontal. Um, what's interesting, though, in a lot of conversations, because from a human rights perspective, obviously the Arab awakening was, hey, guys, it's because of the vertical mm -hmm. that we have this. Mm -hmm. um, and, But when I talk to a lot of people, they're all bemoaning um, the loss of the vertical. And oh, yeah. I always take the position there's got to be another place for us to go because we can't go back there that's what caused this in the first place and it's your idea about the pluralism but how do we get there i mean so that's a really good question it's a it's a it's an essential question <laughs> next question back there please um, uh, the you i'm talking to you uh no um it's actually the, uh, uh, it's the most important question today, and, and um, uh, in a way, I, I don't have an answer for it, okay? Uh, and I'm struggling with this my, my, myself, because um, uh, we assumed that the um, alternative to authoritarianism there was, was democracy, uh, and it turned out to be chaos. Um, and um, so w we wish it had been that, and that was um, uh, because, because there was no consensus on what people wanted their freedom to. Some people wanted their freedom to be more Islamist. Some people wanted their freedom to be more sectarian. Many people, friends of mine, wanted their freedom to be real citizens with equal rights and responsibilities. But they weren't the majority. Um, and so uh, that's the struggle there. And how do you get, I mean, see, I think the challenge of, for American foreign policy today is kind of to work down this progression where there is disorder, complete disorder, we have to try to build order, because you can't go anywhere without order. Where there is order, though, you got to try to make it more decent. That's Egypt. Where there is decent order, Kurdistan, Jordan, you got to try to make it more democratic and consensual. And where there is consensual order, Tunisia, protect it like a rare flower. To me, that's the progression that we've got to be going down. Because my, my fear is that you end up with, I did a column about this, you know, that you end up with just two ruling models in the Middle East, ISIS and SISI, ISIS or CC, they're an anagram, you know, um, and, uh, and that will be a disaster. I think, I think where we're going, I think where CC is going is going to be a disaster. I'm not against order, and I respect my Egyptian friends who want order, but it's got to be order plus. It's got to be order with a pathway. And, 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 yeah, and exactly, and um, what I learned living in the Lebanese Civil War for five years and watching how it was ultimately settled, it was settled on one value principle, no victor, no vanquished. We share the space. That's the tie of agreement was built on exactly that principle. Tunisia has worked because after much struggle and violence and death, that community came together and said, you know what, hope it holds, no victor, no vanquished. And um, wherever you see someone to have a victor and a vanquished, it's not going to work, okay? And that was the huge mistake we made in Iraq. It's the mistake that people you know, make in Syria. And, um, uh, and so without that, um, you'll never be able to go down that progression. So I think I'm getting the hook. I want to thank you all very much. I really appreciate you coming out. And uh, this is a real treat. Thank you very much. Thank you.